Welcome to Happy Path Programming. I'm Bruce Eckel. I'm James Ward. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Today we uh, we have with us Matt Anger, who uh, I came across him because he wrote a blog post about trans uh, kind of transforming from Python to Kotlin, and because Bruce is a big Python fan and wrote a book on Kotlin, uh, and I'm a big Kotlin fan, and I've only done a little bit of Python. Thought it'd be a really fun conversation. So, welcome, Matt. Good to have you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So maybe let's start with a little bit of background about you. You're a, a longtime engineer. I don't know. Let's hear what do you what do you do? What's your what's your background and all that? Uh, my background is kind of all over the place throughout the years. I, I started out doing kind of embedded programming, working on control software for routers and switches. Uh, spent quite a few years at the low levels writing C, writing Linux code, that kind of stuff, and then slowly kind of moved up the stack. Um, transitioning from, you know, pure C to to Python, to Go, to did a little Scala here and there. (laughs) (laughs) Kind of done a little bit of everything throughout throughout my career. Um, And and now my main focus is generally on, um, you know, trying to, you know, help org scale uh, however I can. Um, So so it's a lot of building what I I call middleware services. Um, Not usually like the raw info, but usually things that kind of like, are reusable components that then a lot of teams can use to, to help build, you know, their own, like usually user facing thing. Like very little of what I do is actually like directly face the user, but it's like, Oh, it's a system that like a lot of different teams can use. And, and then they can, you know, help that and build, you know, their business logic in, in an easier or, or more scalable fashion. So um, how much time did you have you, how much experience time wise have you had with Python and Kotlin? Um, I've been doing kind of Python professionally for probably about eight years now mm-hmm. and Kotlin for probably closer to like three or four. Okay. Nice. So long enough to have a reasonable grasp. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So your, your blog post was kind of highlighted the multi-platform pieces of, of Kotlin and why you were transitioning some of your services, I think from Python to Kotlin. Did I get that right? Uh, we transitioned o- almost everything, right? We have, we have some legacy services, but like uh, most of our biggest services are Kotlin now. And then like going forward, the plan is that like all new services are written in Kotlin. And a big driver for that was the multi-platform capabilities of Kotlin. Or, yeah, tell me more about uh, what, Less what's so the multi-platform, that. but more so just trying to to have like a standardization to make it easier for us to kind of share learnings and share code across the org, right? That's, it, was, it was a big thing where, you know, um, we, we had sort of like a, a wide array of different features, different Kotlin frameworks that people were using and things like that. And, and we were running into this issue kind of where it's like, hey, we learned that we have to be careful when using library X, right, for example, um, in, in order to prevent it from, you know, causing a thundering herd or something like that, right? And, and the problem was, is that like when you have, all these different frameworks, all these different languages, um, it, it becomes hard to kind of easily translate those learnings across all these different things, right? So it's like, you can imagine like, hey, we have to be careful when you're doing, I don't know, maybe a type of transaction in the database, right? And you're like, you're trying to translate that between, you know, JDBI and SQL Alchemy and, and, like, and like, you know, all, all these other different ways so we make sure that we can not repeat the same mistake and that becomes a lot harder when you have like i said a, a, this huge array of things and it's like if we can help standardize it becomes a lot easier to provide you know e- easy ways to ensure that teams are doing the right thing but that doesn't sound like a language specific issue i mean you could standardize within python oh oh sure yes yeah okay. there, there, there were other reasons for for wanting to do this right um so okay. Obviously, like as our company was growing and as the sale was going up, um, we, we, we kind of had to leave. So we, we had this old big Django monolith, right? It was, it was an old version of Django, old version of Python. Um, obviously, upgrading that is, is, can be super painful, right? Especially with, with some of these larger sort of monolithic frameworks like Django, like Rails. Uh, major version upgrades can be can be super painful, as I'm sure lots of people have experienced trying to do that, particularly on larger projects, ones that have, you know, hundreds of engineers have been committing code to for, for years. 
and, and now you're like trying to upgrade that. You're like, well, okay, can we just stop all development for like three months while <laughs> sure. we do this major upgrade? Sorry, well, no new pull requests <laughs> while we're doing this. And, and the other like, thing is if work, you're right. going to upgrade your Django, you'd probably want to go all the way to the new uh, async enabled right. one for, for the speed. And that requires... I think some pretty significant changes to your. So you're looking at like upgrades being this like major engineering investment. You're like, if we're going to make a major investment, maybe we should consider some other options too. Mm. <laughs> exactly right. So that that's kind of where it came down to. It's like, okay, does it make sense to to do this, or does it make sense to start thinking, hey, if we're probably going to start breaking some of the stuff up anyway to make it easier, so teams can deploy faster, so that you know we have when we do have to do rollbacks, it affects less things and stuff like that. Um, you know, a lot of the standard sort of services benefits that we have is like, does it make sense for us to continue using Python or, or should we consider something else? So I'm curious, though, um, because it seems like a reasonably significant factor is you have an engineering team that has a whole bunch of experience in the Python way of thinking mm -hmm. and you're changing it to Kotlin and... You know, I mean, that's certainly something to consider where you say, OK, well, we're going to stop everything mm -hmm. and learn Kotlin so we can make this change. So it's kind of like it's not quite as simple as saying, oh, well, upgrading to the latest Python and Django is going to cost this much because mm -hmm. changing languages is significant. So how was that um, process for you? Um, I mean, so we kind of set out looking at like a lot of the major languages out there at the time, right? We kind of, we had, you know, a lot of our senior engineers just kind of get together and start discussing this, like what, what makes sense, right? And, and like, obviously Python 3 and even just doing services in Python was, was one of the things we did consider. Um, and we were like, yeah, should we have all these benefits? Um, I mean, I guess one of the, the downsides, right? And this was a couple of years ago. So like, Python has obviously come a, a, a nice way since then. Uh, but like, you know, there were issues with, you know, even, even upgrading within Python 3, you, were, we, we, you could see potential issues, right? Uh, like even I think async await was standardized at like Python 3.7. So you have a bunch of stuff that would work with 3.6 and not work with 3.7 or the other way around. And, and, and the, so we were seeing like this thing where it's like, okay, does, does it really make sense to, to us to go here? Um, we had we had some teams try to do things with like G event or or even some of the early you know uh, async await frameworks, um, and we would still see you know performance issues related to you know the global interpreter lock and how do we make sure that these services can you know fully utilize their multiple cores and the and the memory that we're assigning to all these pods in the most efficient manner. Um, and just, you know, like, because our scale keeps growing, our, it keeps growing. So it was just kind of like, we, we didn't think that Python made the most sense. Mm -hmm. um, just just in terms of, you know, yes, we're going to pay more kind of teaching everyone, uh, you know, Kotlin um, or, or potentially another language, right? Because we, we were considering others as well. Um, but we, we figured that, you know, the, the cost saving, the long run um, would, would help kind of mitigate some of that, that extra overhead. Plus, we felt that Kotlin was pretty close to, to, you know, kind of Python in a lot of the ways that you write it, right? It's, it's, not, it's not terrible to, like, teach a Python developer how to write in Kotlin, right? We, we, can, we have a lot of, like, little examples here and there that kind of show them some of the, the more functional aspects of it, right? Teaching them how to use some of the, you know, the, the fold Collections map, operations, filter by, yeah, yeah all, all, all those nice things. Um, and just kind of walking them through some of the very common examples. Right. And I, I think one of the things I would like about teaching Kotlin to Python programmers is that I wouldn't have to say, okay, well, this, this feature is stupid, but you know, here's how it works. Whereas <laughs> there are definitely languages we don't need to mention here where it's like almost a constant stream of, oh, yeah, this is a dumb idea, but here's how it works. Yeah. And so you wouldn't be hitting the, and people, people, wouldn't be going, oh, but Python does it better. Why don't we just stay with Python? You wouldn't, you wouldn't be running into that all the time. 
Yeah. 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 Plus, plus, I mean, uh, Kotlin is a little bit more opinionated in some ways, which is, which is good, right? Like it, having, mm -hmm. especially when you're trying to teach more junior developers, having a language that's a bit more opinionated can be very helpful because it's like, well, there's, yeah, yeah, there's like 12 different ways you can do this, but you should really only use these three. And for the most part, we encourage this one. It's like, no, no, just, just do it this way. <laughs> we, Scala, we, Bruce and I are writing a Scala book right now. And, <laughs> and one of the things yes. that, that we find that we're trying trying to avoid is that falling into that trap of like you can do this 10 different ways but here's the way so instead i think our book is mostly focusing on like here's the one way that you do things and so we're trying to be much more opinionated but obviously that's not how generally the scala ecosystem works yeah well and i think they're starting to see that it's a problem i mean when we interviewed dan north yesterday daniel sorry um he, he that was one of his statements is scholar is the least opinionated language he's encountered yeah. And, and yeah it's it is a problem I, I i think yeah and i could see that python is definitely more opinionated but it's not as much as, Kotlin. as, and, as I, Kotlin, and i appreciate yeah. that because it's like why do i have to decide among all of these different ways to do something so but what were your um you know, what was it, what problems were you trying to solve in this language change was, I mean, performance, mm -hmm. but, you know, one of the things that you look at Python and it has this huge ecosystem of really good libraries mm -hmm. and you're giving up at least a significant portion of that if you move to Kotlin at this time. So, you know, uh, that's a I mean, for, for us, we didn't really see it that way, right? Because, mm -hmm. because we're using Kotlin on the JVM, we inherit the entire Java ecosystem, which is just as big, or maybe even probably mm -hmm. even bigger than the Python ecosystem, right? Like the Java ecosystem is, is huge. Mm -hmm. um, and so like we're, we're, we're relying on Netty. We're relying on, you know, gRPC and Cassandra. And we make heavy use of things like Kafka. And, and like as much as, you know, They've tried to make Python on Kafka work. Python on Kafka is still pretty bad when you compare it to what you get with the job, right? There's there's a lot of features that like haven't made it over to Python Kafka that we can now take advantage of because we're using the Java Kafka library uh, on, underneath the hood. Yeah. Um, and, and so like, especially for, for like some of the stuff, like I said, Kafka, Cassandra, um, you know, database access like JDBI and R2DBC are are very nice and extremely powerful, even compared to something like SQL Alchemy or, or some of the, the Python libraries. So for, for us, we were like, you know, we, we didn't really see that uh, as, as a negative when we're looking at well, what do we have access to, right? Um, because particularly for like a lot of the stuff that we do and like when we do geospatial work, we can access, you know, the PostGIS driver uh, directly, right? And these are kind of like the, the de facto, the standard that everyone else is trying to kind of copy, right? A lot of the Python libraries are like trying to wrap these or, or use these these Java libraries to, to kind of get their same features. And it's like, well, we can just directly use the Java libraries now, um, but, and, and, but then still get the the nicer syntax of, of Kotlin versus, you know, Java's a little bit more, you know, verbose syntax. It doesn't have the, the nice kind of concurrency primitives that you get with Kotlin or with Python and things like that. You're you know. being nice. <laughs> um so okay but back to my original question what were was it concurrency or performance or i mean what what were your factors that you were because context matters when you're making and i it. think your blog you actually listed out like yep. five or six different things that you were comparing mm -hmm. on the yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, concurrency was a big one, right? Being able to, to efficiently use the cores and like the memory, basically resource usage, right? We want something that was going to be efficient, that we, we could efficiently use all the resources we were giving to these pods. We want a system that was going to be like easy to monitor, right? Something that we could easily understand, okay, why is this performing the way it is? How do we understand why a, a service is acting the way it does? Uh, we wanted a strong library ecosystem, which is why like we're running Kotlin on the JVM. We're not doing Kotlin native or something like that because we wanted to use the JVM ecosystem. Um, we wanted something that, you know, was, was going to be easy to teach developers and, and something that, you know, we, we thought um, would grow with us, right? That we, we saw that there was like an investment in, in sort of the future of the language and we were seeing, you know, good forces behind it that, you know, we could see libraries coming out that we could you know, develop on top of and, and can kind of continue to, to see that growth, not something that we were going to, you know, three years down the line, we'd be like, okay, well, we're like one of the only ones writing in this language, not what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you 
tell us some of the most, I don't know, dramatic um, improvements you've seen or even surprising ones? Um, so the, the big thing is, is that like, as teams started moving towards these services and started running it, right, we started seeing, you know, the, the performance improvement on sort of like the, the QPS that our services could handle, um, it, was, it was a lot higher than we thought, like the, the level of improvement. Uh, particularly because, you know, some of our services are, are very read heavy and the work they could do. And now we could we could share a cache between, you know, all eight cores in a given pod and things like that. And, and we could much more efficiently kind of use our resources. So we were just seeing much greater per performance, um, better cache it rates for like our in-memory caches when we were when we were using those things. Um, and, and it was, you know, it was it was really nice. And then. Um, the other thing that we really sort of take advantage of more recently was um, using Java agents to kind of help introspect what our services are doing. Um, so the, the big example that I always talk about was the fact that we were basically able to roll out distributed tracing with with no work from any of the service org, right? Like most of the product huh. org had no idea this was going on. Nobody really told them it was happening. It was just sort of like we kind of just went in there added and like a, added and an we agent. added the Otel yeah. Java agent. And suddenly now we have a dashboard that we can go show them. It's like, hey, you can see all the requests flowing your service. And you can truly see what all your downstreams are, not just what you think they are, your, your second and third order downstreams. So you can better understand your work. And it's like, we could just do that for them. Huh. Yeah, that like plugability of like underneath the covers in the VM, being able to insert observability and get all the benefits of it without causing any disruption or any code change or anything is... Yeah, I could see that as being a huge benefit in your case yep. where, you know, you're serving a ton of traffic and so and and a large code base or many large code bases. And, yep. and in the process of this, good. did you see, uh, did you like re-architect everything? Were you able to preserve some of the architecture or was that a lot of that like... Um, I guess you could say, well, we learned a lot in this one, and so now we're going to redo it, take this up. I mean, because that could be part of the reason to change is the opportunity to re-architect your system. And that definitely was, right? We had, we had a lot of things that we did. We, it was kind of like a mixed bag. We had some things where you can look at it and you can be like, oh, yeah, this is basically like a line-for-line -line translation of the Python code. And then there were whole things where we're like, we, we went back to the drawing board and like, hey, what, what if, if we really thought about this now um, and kind of completely changed it right particularly like you know in, in django almost everything was just a database model and, and that's not always efficient for the way some of our data looks and so it's like as long as we're doing this translation hey let's talk about let's move it to cassandra and switch it to like a key value store and use some of these more you know fluid object types um and that, that'll much better represent our data versus like three different tables that we have to join against to build this kind of object that, you know, it really would, didn't fit well in that database model. Mm -hmm. So did you find, I mean, like your Python system, was it lots of objects? And then when you moved to Kotlin, did you become more functional or did you just keep those? Uh, yeah, yeah, we, we definitely tried to push people towards the more functional aspects, um, trying to, you know, get away from that, the, the mutability, right? I embracing Kotlin's immutable by default has been something that we've really tried to push people towards. And we, we've gotten, we've seen pretty good adoption of it. Um, and because you explain it to people, it's like, if things are immutable, you can share it efficiently across cores and never have to worry about race conditions or anything like that, right? It's, it's always the same. And then you, you kind of walk them through, how, how do you, okay, well, how do I build this when I have like all these branching gifts? It's like, okay, show them how to build that immutable object using those, those functional programming paradigms. Um, and, and then they, they get all these benefits and it becomes a lot easier to reason about what their code is doing once they see that. Yeah, I mean, just for, for me, the transition from for loops to map, you know, map functions on collections that took my brain a while to like really grok that change. And yep. now it's, now it's so like, I, I can't write a for loop, you know, like, like I have just fall in love with the functional way of doing things. But I do remember like that transit, the brain transition took a long time. Yeah. For yes. me. I mean, why struggle with these figuring out these folds and things? It's like, just, I, all I want yeah. to do is a for loop. Yeah. And then it does take 
that I don't know. I, I mean, I'm, I'm most of the way through the process myself and I'm going, okay, I see it. I see what and why we're doing it. And also the removal of the redundant code, not just the exposure of the counters, mm -hmm. the mutable counters, but also the, oh wait, that's the thing that we're just doing over and over again, can we just pull that over here? And then we pass in a Lambda to say what we're trying to do. And yeah, it's making sense to me now, but of course I'm trying to figure out how do I make sense, make that make sense to other people. Yeah. Well, oh, I mean, time. I mean, at least the benefit with Kotlin is that, like, in the beginning, you could just use a for each loop, right? And then you're, mm -hmm. you basically get the exact same syntax, right? Yeah. So it's like it's to start with, you just kind of show people, okay, collection dot for each, and it's like, okay, it's basically the same as a for loop, right? You can right. and you can just kind of start there, and then it's like, well, okay, what, what are you really trying to do? Well, I'm actually trying to calculate, you know, maybe the total sum of you know <laughs> someone's tips or something like that. It's like, okay, well, we don't actually have to do a for each where you then add all these counters, right? Yep. showing them that that next step and you kind of go through like a slightly iterative process and, and usually you know you can see the lights start to click once you start walking them through like a concrete example do you mm -hmm. have like a code review system or some way to like help people go through those learnings um so yeah we have we have in terms of code reviews right we have uh like a, a set of linters that we've kind of devised with a set of rules which which help a lot of that right we kind of installed huh. these linters nice. on everywhere but yeah. then we also devised a series of we called them code labs that kind of walk people through okay how do that how do i learn Kotlin, right yeah. and it's like and we some of it is we do point to like some of the official kotlin learning languages like the the koans i think it's called or yeah, things the like that yeah. um and, but then it's like, so we also have some concrete examples kind of from our own code bases showing them, you know, he, here's what we're trying to do when you, when you want to, you know, like I said, calculate the sum of all the tips in the past week or, or something like that. Right. It's like, yeah. and th those concrete examples really help it click in people's minds. But don't you just like, you start seeing what IntelliJ does for you with some of the little things and you're going, <laughs> oh, I'm really looking forward to when you see a for loop and it says, would you like me to put a map or a fold or a, you know, whatever yeah. here? It's like, <laughs> yes, I would, I would like you to yeah. do that for me. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. We, we definitely love IntelliJ here. You know, we, 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 we use it, uh, almost everyone uses it to write Kotlin code. Um, mm -hmm. Well, yeah, likely and your it, developers are using PyCharm before, and so it's not too, <laughs> yep. too that piece of the transition was maybe not too um, mm -hmm. harsh. Oh, yeah. Well, and the other benefit is that, like, a lot of the features you get with uh, in IntelliJ, even on, you know, JVM projects, it, it are, are really nice, right? Like, we can do remote debugging. You can have that, and you can treat it like almost like it's running on your local host, right? You can attach it to, to a, like a pod. And you can step through it like it was something running, right? Which has been yeah. a huge benefit in tracking down some like hard to replicate errors, right? When you can just attach it to like the actual running product and be like, okay, cool. Now I can step through this as though it was just, you know, as though as I just click the debug button in the, in the, in the UI. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, uh, I'm curious about the journey with nullability and mm -hmm. um, and that piece because errors in general because Python doesn't have anything like the the nullability piece of well, Kotlin, it has does it? None. Or... Yeah, it, ha return. it has none, and the, we definitely get bit a lot by none. <laughs> I mean, I, I think a lot of large projects end up having as well. Yeah. 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 So what's what's your experience been with the nullability? That seems to be one of the big things that people appreciate about. Kotlin, um, but yeah, I'm curious. Your well, your... and some people like. W I mean, Bill, our our co-author Bill, had a he did a little experiment with the company he was working for before, where he did something in Kotlin, and he says the biggest thing, and almost for them, the reason to move from Java to Kotlin was because you stopped wasting time chasing nulls. Oh, for sure, right? That that was one of the big reasons why we chose Kotlin over just doing plain Java, right? It, it was mm -hmm. the null safety and also the the null coalescing just makes it when you do have nullables, it's a lot easier to deal with and deal with safely, right? And and like IntelliJ and stuff like throws millions of warnings at you if you're not doing it safely, and and even the Kotlin compiler will yell at you. Um, and so just just kind of having that as a reminder to make sure that you're you're handling it appropriately is is definitely you know saved us more than once. Any challenges on on getting the teams to understand nullability stuff, or um, does the, it come the, pretty easily? 
It comes pretty easily. The only time that we really run into the, the weirdness is when dealing with proto buffs, um, <laughs> because the 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 nullable versus you know yeah. is it was it set or is it the default null or is it a yeah. default zero or a default empty string, um, and, and and that idea can sometimes be a, a little difficult when people maybe expected them to have slightly different semantics and they just kind of don't by default yeah. in protobuf and you have to but that's that's less of a like a Kotlin thing that's more just like learning how to deal with with protobufs which you would probably run into it in most languages regardless yeah. so i'm guessing your architecture is microservices heavy then um i wouldn't call them microservices um we, we try to avoid the like service for everything right i the right. way i always call it is the, the the term that i heard years ago that i kind of like it is bastions where we have sort of like mini monoliths and so we have we have a bunch of these mini monoliths that are, are like focused on their domain. And sometimes they have like auxiliary services that help them for, for specific things. Uh, but for the most part, like you have kind of like one service dedicated towards, you know, a, a fair chunk of a, of, of a given domain. Huh. Well, I think it's kind of like, I don't I hope it's passed away. But uh, at one point in the Java community, they were going, yes, have an interface for every tiny concept and then just mm -hmm. stick them together. And I think that kind of happened with microservices, too. Okay. And so saying, well, let's, oh, uh, I think Dan, yesterday, Daniel was talking about the difference between reusability you know, it's like, oh, we got to make everything reusable. And he's going, why don't you start by making it usable? <laughs> yeah. And not worry about it. And it's like, so if this is what you need, make it that way. Don't say, oh, we got to break it up into little pieces. And then it's confusing. And you look at it and go, why did you do this? Oh, for so This is one of my challenges with, with the microservices like push was mm -hmm. that in the systems I've built, I really don't know what should be broken off into a separate service until I've like built the whole thing. And then I see, oh, this would be a good candidate to like break off. Like, I think it's much easier to like take something monolithic and break it into pieces than it is to try to do that before you have anything, you know? And see, this is one of the things that I've always loved about Python is that I found it easier to do exploratory stuff like that. You can go, okay, let's let's get something together and working, and then we can look at it and go, what makes sense here and what doesn't, rather than having this omniscient architecture perspective, which you don't have. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. But let's pretend we do. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I mean, I mean, a lot of times we find that, like, I mean, as you start thinking about it, you can use your database queries to help kind of understand kind of where the lines are like but this is again like you you have to have a system to know this right if you have a system you can kind of look at okay what tables kind of act as a functional unit right i can look at the queries being executed against this i can look at where the joins are and it's like okay if these these this set of tables is like clearly tightly joined together maybe you're I doing can make database joins across tables that's probably something that you shouldn't break apart and try to yeah. separate <laughs> exactly right so you can kind of like okay so this is a functional unit and then i can i can migrate that away and then eventually i can migrate that into its own separate database for you know scalability and resiliency reasons and, and you kind of like do it as sort of that, that iterative approach the only thing worse than table joins is microservice joins yeah <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> which is definitely where, like, I, I mean, I've seen some people with, like, the, the GraphQL Federation stuff going in where I'm like, this feels like it's going to be really expensive. And, like, maybe they, I haven't looked deeply into it, so maybe they have ways of trying to solve a lot of that. But it's just, you, you look at, like, yeah. what, what's going on with, like, the, the Federation there. It's like, oh, it's going to magically figure out an issue query to, like, all these services. I'm like, that sounds really expensive to do. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's like a whole nother factor of, of added cost or, you know, to like, like they talk about like, you know, accessing memory is like, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. And then you move up to, you know, all these like layers where you just add, add factors to, to your, your number and like database table joins are like the, like cheapest join you can possibly get. And then you go to application layer joins and it's like a whole nother factor of, of, uh, yeah, added cost to doing it. Well, and it's so interesting. Try to avoid them. Because <laughs> you, you, 
you, you said, oh, and then we go back and we look at the data and what mm -hmm. we're doing with the data. And to me, that's more functional thinking. It's like, start with the data, don't, I don't know, do all the stuff that we've done with objects and, and say, oh, well, we have the data structure. Now we have to cluster all of these specific functions around it that aren't reusable. Yeah. And, uh, or, or ha that we have to write from scratch. There's mm -hmm. probably the thing is like, whereas if you go, well, you know, what's our important data structure? And now we have all of these tools that we can just apply to it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, definitely. Like, I mean, I, th I think one of the big things that we, you know, we've kind of gotten really good at is, is doing like the, the POC and like just, just figuring out like, what does it actually look like? Let's actually benchmark if, if, proof of concept. Proof of right? concept. Okay. Right. So just kind of like, okay, mm -hmm. let, let, let's just sketch this out. It doesn't have to be perfect. Right. And we're not going to run obviously a hundred percent of prod data through it. Right. We can just shift a small amount of traffic and just, just try this out and see like, is this actually going to work the way, like in theory, we think it's going to do, right? It's like, it's one of those cases where it's like, you can reason about it and you can, you can think you know what your system is doing. But like a lot of times there's like corner cases that'll just like completely destroy your assumptions, right? You run into a lot of these, especially with, with complex systems or, or systems like ours that deal with the real world, right? Anytime you try to deal with the real world, like you're going to run into situations that just did not match your expectations. Um, and, and so, you know, trying trying things like out in the real world on like a small percentage of traffic you'll just learn infinitely more than you would trying to sketch everything you know on a whiteboard or something like that huh. yeah just don't know everything up front and so mm -mm. you're gonna no. do experiments right and get as close to what you actually are trying to do as possible uh, yeah. Yep. Like I, like I said, you shard off a piece of traffic or do do shadow traffic if you have the, the, the functionality to do that, right? You're going to learn more than any sort of synthetic test you, you try to come up with. Um, I, I, I think, can you expand on shadow traffic? Because I think this is a fascinating concept that is kind of a bit newer in architectural realm. So yeah, give us the rundown on shadow traffic. Oh yeah. I mean, it, it, essentially it's a way of, you know, basically duplicating production traffic, right? It, it, it's for when you want to run like, I guess the, the riskier test, right? Like, so you can do like a small percentage of traffic. If you're, if you're fairly certain, you're not going to completely take stuff down, but let's say you have something that's, that's a lot riskier that you really just want to try something kind of way out there. And it's like, you can use something like, you know, nginx or, or envoy stuff like this and you can kind of like duplicate your traffic so like all the, all the things that your users are actually seeing it's still going through your existing systems and you're just kind of replaying that uh, on your other new system that you're trying to figure out okay is this going to behave the way i want to and, and that way you're not you know like i said accidentally taking things down if you're trying to do something like really experimental or kind of really out there compared to what your existing architectures are so you can understand how it's going to work so that sounds like something we interviewed someone about Kafka a mm -hmm. while back. And that sounds like something where, oh, if you had a Kafka system collecting all of these events, then you could just replay them as your shadow. Um, uh, yep. Oh, oh, yeah. Ka Kafka is great for that, right? If, if you're using an event-driven system, right, you can spin up a second consumer group, right? And then it's, it's not affecting the, the existing production traffic, right? And it's just reading on its own pace. If it's too slow, like, that's fine. It, it, it's not affecting anything else, right? And if you want to reset and go back to some time in history, you know, you can do that. Um, it, it, it's Kafka is great for, for doing things like this. And it's real data. Yeah, it's real data. It's, it's not data you have to make up and hope that you've covered all the cases. So what are you doing? What's your error strategy other than, I mean, Kotlin helps with nulls, but what about, you know... Exceptions, mm, like failures, a, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, one thing that we've been really pushing towards is is trying to have safe defaulting and kind of catching those errors at the top level and, and returning that safe default, right? Um, and it, it's one of those things where we've kind of learned that not not only do we have to make it easy to do the right thing, we have to make it hard to do the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. um, which is which is something that I, I think not a lot of developers realize is kind of something that you end up having to do like as your org scales is you have to make it hard to do the wrong thing so that developers almost always do the right thing. Um, so mm -hmm. like, you know, we, we, we've modified our, our cache libraries, right? So if you're trying to reach out to the cache, you have to provide a fallback value. 
so that if the cash is down for some reason or if the cash is going through some maintenance, yeah. right, you use the fallback value. And the fallback value shouldn't just be throw exception. It should be like actual data that it should be safe for you to use. Um, and, and kind of trying to huh. in, instill those and kind of codify those and force developers to think in that way, um, you know, it really helps deal with because because there's always going to be transient fares, right? There's going to be a node failure, a cache is going to go down. You know, you're going to have to do an upgrade at some point. Like all these and things instead are, of just bubbling that air up to yeah. the caller, you're saying the person that is calling the cache needs to tell it what to do to to return a usable value instead yep. of just blowing up and letting the caller have to deal with it. Yep. It, it's interesting how much psychology <laughs> is involved because you're going, well, yeah, the, a portion of our programmers will know to do that all the time, but that's not the problem. The problem is everyone else, new programmers coming on. I mean, for the longest time, I remember thinking, um, I, I was just programming the happy path. You know, I was yeah. just going, yeah, uh, the failures, they're too messy. I'll just see if I can get something to work. And if it fails, okay, then I'll fix that. But if it doesn't, then I think I should, I'm okay, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't have to, I, I just saw- Nothing I, can I, go wrong. Nothing could go wrong. I just came across a um, something, I think it was from one of Kevlin Henney's presentations. And he pointed out that most, he, from a paper, and he said, most of the failures happen because basically exception handlers don't get tested. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you go, oh, wait, now my, now I'm, now I got a whole new thing to puzzle about because it's like, well, of course it makes all kinds of sense. And now it's like, well, we're, we didn't think about that. We, we just got to the point where we're going, well, we have a way to throw exceptions and catch them we're good. And then it's like, oh, nobody thought about the second level effects of how do you test the exception handlers? Right. right. And, and that, that's where like chaos testing comes in. And, and we're not 100% there yet, but we're, we're, we're getting there, right? Where we're, we're, we're going to start, you know, maybe we'll just start introducing latency between two services at some time mm -hmm. just to make sure that they handle it appropriately. Uh, and, you know, maybe we'll just block access to your database and like, how are you going to handle it? How are the people calling you going to handle that? Right. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, we're, we're not 100% there yet, but we're, we're working to get there because like at the end of the day, We'll, we'll try to do as much as we can in code, but there's going to be some that we, even that's going to miss. And, and we're going to need to like force these things to happen. And, and the, the trying to make sure that our system can handle when those failures happen and that they don't, you know, take down the whole system and that we have appropriate, you know, failure domains and really the, you, you, you got to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Latency seems like a place where it's easy for developers to miss the possibility that a that a network call could all of a sudden be super high latency mm -hmm. and what happens does it just spin you know because the user is probably sitting there just waiting for something to happen and yeah like like you know obviously like the part of the solution is requiring um sensible timeouts on things mm -hmm. and then but then the other part is what do you do when you hit your timeout and so but as you what what is it one of the the fallacies of of distributed systems is you just don't want to think about latency right that it's and, just and a it, lot easier to ignore that latency isn't a thing and it doesn't even have to be super high latency right there there was a time at a previous company i was working at where um like we, we had a redis that was very fast right in, in general because of the way we, we were this is we weren't running in the cloud at this company so i was like in general we were seeing you know less than a millisecond latency to talk to this redis and so we used it for a lot of stuff and then yeah. one day it got slightly overloaded and and latency went to one millisecond and you're still like one millisecond that's fine and it's like no we do like 300 reads per request on this we just destroyed our p95 our system yep. is now like burning tons of cpu not able to process anything uh and it's like it's it's not even the the case where it's like oh this has an extra 100 milliseconds of latency sometimes even you know half a millisecond of latency on a system that you've become to rely on because historically it was so fast yeah. and suddenly your system just falls apart yeah yeah, I think that's the, that's the interesting aspect to this, and and the, maybe the place where chaos engineering is maybe the only way that you can account for it. But it is not. I think as developers, we generally 
Yeah, not always, but generally we think about what latencies are. And when mm-hmm. we're building a system, we're building it on some assumed latency, like typical latency. What we usually don't account for is when that latency changes. Yep. And and that's where that's where I think we run into operational issues is the latency changed for whatever reason and then then chaos happens. So how can mm-hmm. we use chaos engineering to to uh, make those latency changes happen in a controlled way so that then we know like, oh, here's how the system is then going to deal with that. Yep. And, and another thing that we've been trying to, to get towards is, is understanding when systems are behaving and when they're starting to get a little bit slower. Because that, that's the one thing that I think a, a lot of observability systems kind of don't necessarily bubble up readily that and a lot of people miss it, right? It's like, what happens to the the, the slow creep latencies uh, where it's like, sure, it's 300 milliseconds, then tomorrow it's 301, and then t- the day after 302. At, at any given point in time, most developers are looking at an hour, three hours, six hours worth of data. They don't see anything. It looks like a flat line. It's slow like creep, when you look yeah. at like six months worth of data, you can see, oh, this, this endpoint is now like, starting to get really slow and, and maybe it's not yet burning your SLO, but it's going to, if you don't change something soon um, is, and, and trying to catch that is, 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 a, is a bit hard. of a harder problem. Is that the kind of thing that you were starting? Because I can imagine Python working really well up to a point where it's like, Oh, it's starting to become a, is that the kind of thing you were seeing? Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Like, I mean, in, in, in the early stages of the company, right? Python was, great people were like doing the proof of concepts and like throwing things and just building products in like in a week right and just kind of like shipping out and like oh look this is great it works it's amazing um and, and then it's, it's one of those things where it's like all that complexity um and, and like not necessarily like python issue but it's like a, more of a like the flexibility that like things like django will allow you it's like suddenly you're looking and you're like well what happened i just updated the user's name what's going on it's like Oh yeah, and there's like 14 different safe hooks that are going to end up getting executed on that now because that has to get propagated through all these other systems, and and you didn't realize that was going to happen, and now each one of those is taking slightly longer because maybe our index wasn't set up properly, um, so like it, it's scanning more rows than it should be, and even if no one's added any code, it gets a little bit slower every time a new user onboards, um, and it's right. like <laughs> catching those issues and and understanding that they're happening is is definitely like a, a bit of a harder problem problem than a lot of people understand yeah so, latency is um, increasing because of not necessarily because of code complexity increases but also because of data amount of data increases that's just one other way that things can change yep that is that is not easy to test for <laughs> yep well so okay the the thing that would concern me about making a language change for the reason and I know you have lots of other reasons, but for the mm-hmm. reason of the concern about performance is it's like, well, how do you know you won't get to a point where you're going, oh, darn, we should have actually used Rust because. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that's definitely there. And Rust was one of the languages we considered. Um, mm-hmm. I, again, this was a couple of years ago. So like async Rust wasn't really standardized back then. And so especially like trying to teach a lot of developers how to deal with callback pattern is mm. like the, the few times I've tried to do that at other companies with other languages, it has been extremely difficult. Um, like callback pattern as powerful as you can make it. It, it is and, and like you can get super fast, right? Definitely faster than you can get usually with, you know, the async and the like the coroutines and greenlets and stuff like that. Um, you, you can definitely make it insanely fast. And I've seen some great systems that use that pattern. Uh, but like you need developer to really understand what they're doing <laughs> yeah. versus just like, you know, with, with core a lot of foot, like, a lot of foot guns in the, oh, in the, the callback pattern. Oh, for sure. Right. It's like, and when you give them, you know, greenlets, core routines, that kind of stuff, it's like, it looks like the standard imperative programming they're used to. And so it's a lot easier for them to focus on the business logic. Um, so we just see a lot greater productivity. Yeah, I think there's a lot of scaling issues when you look at concurrency in general, because, you know, you explain locks and threads to somebody and they go, oh, that's obvious. That should work regardless. And then and then saying, well, no, when it starts getting bigger or 
I mean, this is the issue we had with checked exceptions. It's like, yeah, it's clearly the thing that you want to do. And then you go, but when you actually do it, there's all these other things that make it not scale. And it seems like the, the callback pattern just obviously has that. It's just like, oh, only it works in the small. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've seen, I've seen this... Um argument where people will say like, oh, immutability is slow. Um, and uh, what what I've seen happen in a lot of cases, though, is that when people write immutable code, they can do things, they can do concurrent things in a way where in the like Java world, the way that we would deal with certain concurrent issues was just to like wrap synchronized blocks around things, which just like stuffs you into the single threaded world. Mm -hmm. And so you just like, like take all the benefits of concurrency and throw them out so that you can be safe. But and briefly, in the world, only briefly. Yeah, that's right, only briefly. And so it's what I've actually public. seen in a lot of production systems is that immutability is actually significantly faster because they didn't have to like throw the big synchronized block around things. Yep. Oh, and the big benefit of Kotlin over Java is that you can get that, you can get that a little bit easier than having to rely on like builder or factory classes. Like you can still yeah. do that immutable immutable in, in the Java world, but you have to build factory classes for almost everything. You have to use kind of the builder pattern and then you create an object whose like every property is is private and then you yeah. can't see it you can't do anything you only access it through the get methods that you provided and that, yeah. that, that's a it's a it's a fair amount of kind of boilerplate code that you don't have to write in the kotlin world which is that's kind of right. why we're like oh this is really nice we can we can help people embrace some of those patterns it's easy to be immutable <laughs> yeah it's easy <laughs> and it's, it's easy to have defaults and like because you can have defaults in your function parameters and so you can have like big complex constructors without needing the builder pattern to, to kind of still get those benefits and, and set the defaults in, in a nice way. Yeah. Yeah. Default parameters and name parameters are pretty uh, huge. But that's for... all just syntactic. Sure. <laughs> it, it, it is, but that's I'm a lot less code facetious. I need to maintain. <laughs> I'm being facetious. That's just I know. the thing people say. Oh, it's, it's, you just, just write in Java. It's, you, you... Okay. Remember the Barry Hawkins quote from long ago? Yes. Yes. Uh, so, uh, toilet paper is just syntactic sugar, <laughs> but I want it. <laughs> but I want. It. Oh yeah. yeah, no. I think I think diminishing syntactic sugar is really uh, problematic. I mean, it's like, yeah. Well, I used to program in an assembly language. It sounds like you might have as well. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, everything on top of that is just syntactic sugar. <laughs> it's like I don't want to go back to assembly language. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so I'm glad you brought up coroutines because I wanted to ask you about your experience with coroutines. Mm -hmm. And it sounded like you're using R2DBC, yep. which is awesome. So yeah, tell us about your usage of, of coroutines and are you using coroutines with R2DBC for reactive and all that? Yep. Oh, we, we definitely are. Um, like we, we still have a, a lot of systems that use JDBC, but like a lot of our newer ones are using R2DBC instead, right? Um, it, we were a little bit hesitant at first, right? Trying to benchmark it, try to get a few services on board. Um, just to make sure that, you know, it was scalable because it's, it's a lot of it's pretty new, right? And so we just wanted to make yeah. sure that we could battle test it before we kind of went all in on it. Um, but maybe, like just, we, uh, maybe say what R2DBC is. Sorry. Yes, please. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, R2DBC <laughs> is basically like the, the next generation kind of reactive database access layer um, for the Java world, right? It's, it's, it's got a lot of big, heavy players behind it. And the, the point is to kind of re replace JDBC and JDBI, which are... They have present like blocking views with the new kind of reactive programming, both in Java, but then also because, you know, with Kotlin, you can easily turn reactive into coroutine friendly, right? You get, you get coroutine friendly database accesses where you can, you know, call a wait on them and, and it's not a blocking thing um, yeah. versus like with, with, with Java or with, not with Java, with JDBC, right? We end up having to use like things like executors where we have to push that database query off to something and then get the, the, the job back thread and, pools, and kind of yeah using a thread pool to kind of kind of mirror that that asynchronous access where we don't have to do that with a with a react a reactive native client um yeah. but the, like the one thing we did run into is we had libraries that that claim to be reactive or claim to be nio that were just thread pools underneath um oh, and, and no. that that was something <laughs> yeah. that that bit us a few times because we didn't necessarily realize that they weren't truly reactive um mm -hmm. and then like when you're doing coroutines, you're like, coroutines are lightweight. I can spin up thousands of these and do big, like, 
scatter gather things where I'm fetching yeah. a whole bunch of data and then recombining it afterwards. And it's like, why, why is my everything so slow? Why, why is only three coroutines active at this given time? It's like, oh yeah, that's because there's actually a thread pool of Based two or three it. underneath. Yeah. 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 And it's just doing blocking. <laughs> it's a blocking IO thread pool. Yeah. yeah. And, and so like we had to learn to e- either tune those libraries to work well in our coroutine world or, or find libraries that were real reactive or, or real NIO based. And, yeah. and so we, we weren't dealing with some of those issues. Yeah. Reactive is most valuable when it's, when you're reactive all the way down. Yeah. <laughs> not, not just in the surface layer. Yeah. So yeah. How has coroutines been for the developers that are coming from Python and it's, how's that world for them? Oh, I mean, it's, it's great. Um, because like I said, giving them that kind of imperative view and, and showing them how to do that, that kind of like scatter gather approach for when they need it. it. It's like they they can see the benefits, right? It's like, oh, I need to go fetch 10 different users data. Like you can fire off all 10 requests at the same time and then just do an await all on it back. Yeah. Um, and so they, they can see, you know, especially now that we have distributed tracing, right? They can see the benefit in their stack trace where it's like instead of a whole bunch of blocking calls right next to each other, they see 10 at the same time. And, and then it just it comes back and they, they, they see the improvements right away. Yeah. Uh, on the stack trace thing, I'm glad you mentioned that. So, so with coroutines, you like lose that like stack trace, like when you're doing development, like, you know, you're, um, yeah, like if you throw an exception or whatever, like you're going to lose that context. Has that been a challenge on the development side or? Um, not, not as much, particularly like the more recent versions of IntelliJ have gotten really good at, at making things a lot easier to read. Um, with the more recent versions of, you know, the Kotlin plugins, it's it, debugging coroutines is substantially easier than it, than it used to be these days. Yeah. 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 Maybe there's now sufficient tooling where it's not a big deal to lose that stack on and with coroutines. Yeah. Um, I do find it inspiring that, um, you know, Kotlin is the language that JetBrains, you know, wanted to create for its own purpose. And as a result, it's also been getting a lot of love inside of IntelliJ. And so you kind of go, yeah, that's probably gonna get more and more support and betterness as time goes on. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when when Kotlin was first announced, I was like, "Really? Like the IDE company is creating a programming language?" Like, I don't know, I just was skeptical about that. But then then as you think about the benefits that somebody creating an IDE and a language together where you can get to, um it it seems to make sense, right? And it seems from experience like, yeah, the IDE experience uh, I think uh, yeah, it doesn't I mean, have the legacy of 20 years of Java. You know, it doesn't have quite all the intelligence yet, but, um, but or the it, baggage. Yeah. Or the baggage. True. Yeah. yeah but um, I mean, you can see the same thing with Microsoft and a lot of the .NET languages like yeah. C sharp, F sharp, right? You look at what the, what virtual visual studio can do with those languages and like all the plugins and intelligence they have there. And you're just like, wow, this is really a, a nice developer experience. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, and the, the language, design choices that they made I just feel really they kind of went 180 degrees from what Java did where they you know initially they were just going yeah let's just make all this stuff up we don't actually have to see if it works in the world whereas with Kotlin they said let's see what the other languages did and we'll just steal the best features that have shown themselves to be great Mm-hmm. And I just really like that approach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I definitely. And I mean, like you can, you also see it like Java is now stealing a lot of features from Kotlin, which then also makes it easier on the Kotlin crew because they, they can use the slightly more Java native syntax and get better performance kind of for free without having to change anything. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, like I think it's, what is it? Project Loom that's trying to add like greenlets to the native, to the JVM. It's like, that's going to help. Yep. Kotlin's coroutine performance be a lot better once we get back because we'll have you yeah. know, native understanding and, and native optimization. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think ultimately, because I've, I've seen some of the attempts that, and give them credit, they're dealing with this horrible backwards compatibility problem, but things like the 
um, pattern matching in mm -hmm. Java. It's just like, I think what that'll do is push more people to Kotlin because once they start struggling with that and they go, oh, either, either they'll say, oh, pattern matching is terrible or they'll go, oh, I get why you'd want pattern matching. Java's pattern matching is um, not what I want. Insufficient. <laughs> yeah. Yes, insufficient, and uh, and that'll push them to Kotlin. I hope. Yeah. 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 Um, I wanted to to end on a topic that we kind of actually started with, which was like one of the challenges I think for organizations is. Do, how much freedom do you allow teams to have in like picking the technologies they want to use versus like, there's some nice things about having that freedom, but there's some trade-offs where you kind of mentioned organizational wisdom mm -hmm. and how when everyone is using the same technology and same tools, you, you build and you build organizational wisdom in a way that you don't get when you're on the other side of that with the, like the full freedom for teams to choose their own. So yeah. I want to get your thoughts on like, like how do you think about like, like that world? I, of... I, 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 in my mind, it's one of those things that kind of ebbs and flows as the organizational growth, right? Like when it's small, it's a free for all. And then when you get to this middle scale, you kind of have to standardize um, just because like growing pains and again, organizational wisdom and, and trying to make the best use of, like your infra and dev fraud and, and like those kind of platform teams where it's like, if you, if you have the free for all, those teams have to be pretty large in order to really properly support the free for all. Um, yeah. and, and so kind of like when you hit that medium scale, right, those teams probably haven't scaled up maybe as quickly as the rest of your org. So you, you tighten, you tighten the reins a little bit and try to get you to that state where it's like, okay, we can support these things really well. Let's try to standardize on them so we can really use them. And, and yeah, you lose a little bit of that flexibility, but you, you try to keep things flexible enough that you're not really hampering developer productivity. Um, and then obviously once you get huge and you have, you know, 800,000 person <laughs> platform teams that are supporting all this stuff, it's like you can kind of open the floodgates again and it becomes slightly more of a free for all, right? So that, that, I mean, that, that's kind of the, the way I've seen a lot of folks do it. And like, that's kind of like what we're going through right now, right? We're kind of in that more of that medium sized org where we're gonna like, hey, let's try to standardize on these few things. Let's not let kind of like anyone do anything they want because yeah. it's 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 too hard for our, our platform teams to, to, to support right. every single... It's like your DevOps teams. They're like, we know how to do observability on Python and the JVM. Yeah. And sure, Rust would be great in some cases, but we have no idea how to like do operational uh, observability around rust, you know, just yep. as an example. Yeah. And so they're like, do you, do you want to give us 20 more people so that we can go like do that? Or, you know, put 20 more, 20, those 20 people into building features, I guess. And that's the organizational trade-off is like, how much do you, yeah, invest in, in where and yep. it's, there's just trade-offs I'm sure in a lot of different directions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you know, you're using the quote unquote, right language, Great, but I often, I mean, I keep finding that as I learn other languages, it really strongly influences in a positive way the existing languages that I already know when I'm writing code in those. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, like learning, I learned Go before I learned Kotlin and it's like, it was a, it was a super useful to have that experience and, and they, they really influence each other, right? It's like, you can see why the way Kotlin does like coroutine scopes and context and things like that. And the way it helps handle cancellation it is a lot easier than how you do that in Go. And it's like, oh, you know, even though I really like Go and like concurrency is like super simple in Go, right? It's like Kotlin makes it a little bit more difficult, but it's like I can see why and I can see the benefits of it where I don't have a bunch of like basically dead coroutines over here in the Go world, still doing a whole bunch of work when if I could have more easily propagated that cancellation, cancellation yeah. to them, they, they could can't, they could stop doing that and stop wasting resources. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that I hope for our industry and the world of developers is that people get exposed to more languages because it's definitely helped me be a better developer in, in so many ways by being exposed to so many languages and yeah, I mean, I, 
I feel kind of sad when people are like, I've only ever done Java. It's like, <laughs> there's a whole other world out there. And yeah. when they say, because Java is awesome, why would I want to learn anything else? Yeah. And you're going, programming is awesome. That's the experience yeah. that you're having. You don't understand the limits of your language. So yeah. you think it's yeah. awesome. I mean, I'm always a big fan of trying everything out. Like I've, I've tried probably almost every language under the sun at one play, time or another. It's like it just if something new comes out. You see a lot of great, you know, press around order. It's like, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll try it. I'll, I'll build a basic web server. It's one of the, it's one of the, like the things that I do these days. It's like if a new language comes up, I think it looks interesting. I'll just build a basic web server in it, right? Just build yeah. an echo server or something like that, right? It, it won't take you very long. And it'll, it'll teach you a lot about how the languages deal with this stuff, dealing with, you know, Rust copy checker and things like that, or <laughs> Kotlin coroutines and scopes. It's like, you, you'll learn a lot, even just building something small like that, that should take you, you know, no more than a day in most languages. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, anything else? Okay. Well, thank you, Matt. Thanks for sharing your wisdom with us and um, super fun to chat with you and, and let me know if I can help with any Kotlin stuff. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It was a bit of, it's been a pleasure. All right. Thanks All right. for joining us. Thanks. Bye.